are connected to 5G go live. All right, folks, and we are live. Uh, we skated in by the skin of our teeth for the September live Yawa, and we appreciate everybody's patience. It's a, it's a lot of uh, moving pieces here at the kennel, and um, it's definitely once a month is working is working a lot better than trying to squeeze it in every single week. So yes. um, I wanted to say as people are checking in, I know everybody got a quick bebop in. Ooh, Hit the record button. Kelly, where were you at, Kelly? Mm. <sighs> we'll have to start this over. All right, and we're all right. So we're live, folks. And what we've got here is uh, the check in, right? We want to know where everybody's from, but we also want to know where you have already hunted, what animals you have killed, and or what your first planned trip is. For example, me just got the opportunity to go up to South Dakota. Um, yes, I like hunting the prairie grouse early season, and um, I've driven past a lot of what is. I've been finding out potentially good opportunities to grouse hunt, to drive to Montana, which Montana is awesome, but it's a long freaking way up there. So we stopped in South Dakota, killed a bunch of sharp tails. It was an absolutely awesome trip. So I want to hear from you guys where you are at and what you are planning on killing first. Are you hiring Wesley? Uh, just so you know, yeah, we are. Pretty much always looking for awesome people. And if you are interested, hit us up with an email. Not in the comment section here. Cat. Yes. Uh, you haven't checked in. You're supposed to check in something. <laughs> well, you've been doing a lot of talking, so I'm just uh. letting you roll. So um, I have not been hunting yet. I was holding down the fort with the boys while Ethan was in South Dakota. And I actually am looking forward to my first hunt of the year coming up uh, the end of October. Get to go up to South Dakota. I'm going to bring the boys. It's going to be a fun time. Uh, my first opportunity to hunt in South Dakota with Ethan, kind of prime time of the season. Usually I get to go up late season after he's done guiding. Uh, bird numbers are a little mm, more down. A uh, little harder, just harder to, to get harder on. Harder to come yeah. by. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And I mean, who has not watched the video from last year and gone, heck yeah, I want to be there. I want to be doing that. And Ethan put that video out last year and I watched it and I'm like, I can't be left behind again for like the ninth year in a row. So I'm going to be there in one of those groups during prime time this year. So pretty excited. You heard it folks. So this will be the ninth season that I have guided in South Dakota and have kind of been able to evolve through that from helping run dogs for a few small groups to all of the groups at the lodge to now managing the lodge and property essentially. Um, we just did that giant giveaway with DT Systems and a couple other big companies, and um, that was announced. The winners were, and um, now that we've announced those winners, we actually have five spots left to fill that group out. So if you are interested in coming to hunt with me during that time period, the dates are arrive the 23rd, hunt 24, 25, 26. So again, arrive October 23rd, hunt 24, 25, 26. You can depart on the 26th in the evening or the next morning. No problem. It is arrive the 23rd, hunt 24, 25, 26. I am going to give uh, priority. Is that the right word? Pri priority? Preference? Preference. preference uh, to someone that has the opportunity to fill all five spots. I'd like to keep the hodgepodging as little as possible, if that's possible. But ultimately, we have the five spots to fill if that's something you're interested in. The hunt spot is all-inclusive, uh, pretty much all-inclusive. Um, meals, lodging, uh, bird cleaning, uh, me with dogs. I was explained before that I need to, like, throw that in at the end because it's not really an addition to the thing. It's more like a, meh, I guess we get stuck with you. Um, Access to the property. Yeah. All wild birds. 100% wild birds. And I was just up there taking a look at stuff and things look good. The sharp tail hatch, the excuse me, burr, 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 the sharp tail hatch, there I got it out, um, was absolutely fantastic. I mean, we only shot 
young birds, and there were lots of them everywhere. So I got to believe pheasant hatch is going to be just as good. Habitat looks good, even though they've been dry. That specific area we hunt wasn't hugely affected by the hatch, um, but or hugely affected by the drought, excuse me. It falls into the, the less affected parts of the state of South Dakota as a whole being dry. Um, but five spots available. Hit us up. What's our email? Contact us at standingstonekennels.com, right? Yes. It's not contact us. It's contact at standingstonekennels.com. Contact at standingstonekennels.com. Or go to our website, fill out the contact form. However you want to, email, text me. Our numbers are up there too. Get in touch with us sooner rather than later. Going to be These are going to move quickly. So if it's something you're interested in, you can rope in a few of your buddies. Let us know. So speaking of hunting and the upcoming season, let's see where some of these people Ooh. are planning on hunting because we love to hear from all of our fans. What do we got? Checking we got? in from South Dakota. I mean, that's New pretty. Mexico. Checking in early from South Dakota. That's perfect. Hey, yo. Louisiana, New Mexico, Pennsylvania, Indiana, Alberta, Canada, Cottonwood, California. Hey, I got those right this time. I didn't try and say Canada, California, mixing it up. Nice job, babe. Sturgis, South Dakota, hey Nebraska. Yo. Hey, Melanie and Duncan from Minnesota. Oh, and uh-huh. Don. And Don. And Don. Y'all are going to come down here. Next weekend. Next weekend. Heck yeah. I'm excited. Washington State, New Jersey. And Kelly, where were you? Telling Ethan to push the record she button. She said, I was logging in the one time I trust him to do his job. And, and I had to, like, step in there. At least somebody remembered, though. Before we were halfway through this thing, the bourbon, land of the cheese. Bourbon is hard to drink in the heat of the summer, and it was hot today. So, uh, gin and tonic, refreshing, yeah, cool, we, cold. We needed ting one of these. Yeah. Tonight. So, uh, no bourbon tonight, folks. But it's with my special mermaid gin that Ethan got for me. So uh-huh. delicious. Mermaid gin. So good. Lots of places all over. Okay, love your videos. Thank you. Let's see. Checking in from the 406 here in Montana. Cool. Battle Axe, Michigan. Bad Axe. Oh. Battle, Battle Axe <laughs> sounds way cooler. I just We're saw just going to start axe making up places like, for you guys to be living. Hello from, I don't know. I got nothing. Arizona, up Arizona, Louisiana, Iowa, whoop, whoop, Tennessee. Oh, uh, oh it wow. Just did a glitchy thing. I don't know. It scrolled really fast. Yeah, it did. It pulled to the bottom and said, wow, lots of people are commenting, guys. Lots of people. We Got some South it. Dakota hunting trips. That's awesome. Fantastic. It's more South Dakota hunting. I mean, oh, yeah. It's pretty. Deer this weekend, switching to Doc, then Upland for the dogs in November. Cool. What else we got here? Just got back from Montana grouse hunting. How awesome. was that? Hopefully it was good for you. Yeah, how was it? I want to know. What, what were the numbers like up there? They are late. We were two minutes late because Ethan was mixing me a drink. I mean, I don't know why he didn't have that ready. It's like he should have read my mind. But uh, It starts to melt early. Touche. Mm-hmm. Uh, we were late. Uh, just a, a minute, though. Come on now. Cut us some slack. Trying to it get was two boys to 60 bed. Seconds. Two sick 60 boys seconds. to get bed. Yeah. Uh, 10 month old on some doves. Hell yeah. What else we got here? North Dakota, Kansas. Olive says hello from Indiana. Hello, Olive. Hoping to go to Michigan for grouse. Heck yeah. Alabama. Lots of check-ins. Lots of check-ins. This is awesome. I love having this many people checking in and watching us. We got a bunch of people here right now. So let's talk about, um, a couple of cool things. One cool thing is we appreciate all of you guys who follow and subscribe to our channel. And that has allowed us, if you haven't seen, and we haven't actually gotten a chance to do a video yet because life has been very crazy, but we hit 100,000 subscribers thanks to, in part, you guys, which is awesome. And there it is, the silver play button. Like it's a mirror. It's, uh, It's all official and everything. Ooh, and Stains and Kennels, kennels. 100,000 subscribers for passing 100,000 subscribers. That's pretty cool. I do want to say, um, nice job, YouTube. I mean, uh, I, I mean, this is kind of cool. 
It is really cool. It's going to go up on our wall. Dude, that's so shiny. Look at It's like a full-on mirror. It's a mirror. Yeah. So, pretty cool. Pretty Silver excited play for button. that. Uh, I think the next uh, tier is at a million. So, so it's going to be a second. We yeah. got a ways. We got a minute before like we'll they be They dangle there. a little carrot like, oh, you're doing so good. It's going to be a while. <laughs> what color is the next one? Gold? Uh, I don't know. Diamonds. If this is silver, it's got to be gold because then it goes to platinum and then diamond. I think the, or diamond and then platinum or something. There's like a diamond tier. Uh, I don't know. And this is actually a, a solid diamond because they're like, well, if you've got 10 million subscribers, we've already made close to a billion dollars off of your channel. So we'll literally give you uh, uh, $10,000. I'm pretty sure you're making dollar. that up now. So. Yes. Okay. 100%. Moving on. Other cool news, if you didn't see the comment that Ethan typed up ahead of time and pinned up to the top, we are giving a med kit away tonight. I've got it over here, but it's kind of just in a box, which is how it's going to ship to you, Uh, but I'll get it out anyway. I mean. So, med kit, there's the, the bag that it comes in. Comes in the Mud River bag. Then it's got all of the accoutrement, including a first aid kit book. Uh, there's flashlight. There's pill pockets. There's oh, there's the list. Mm-hmm. I'm trying to do it from memory. If you want to see everything that is in this, just go to StandingStoneSupply.com, search med, med kit. kit, and it'll show up there to give you the full. Yeah, yeah that's sucking. Whatever. StandingStoneSupply.com, search med kit. You will see everything that's in it and decide, hmm, I don't know if I want to take the time to type in an email and win this. Or I mean, not. it's only $350 value, so. Psh. Mm. But you can see pictures of all the things that are coming in that bag for you, uh, as well as a list of all the really cool items. And awesomely enough, when you get it this year, hopefully. You don't end up having to use it, but if you do or things expire by next season, we do have refill kits also available that you can get um, to stock it back up, which is kind of cool. Yeah, and uh, the the one last thing that I was going to say with that specifically is uh, for the folks that are already throwing questions in there asking, um, we do... Um, we do plan to answer questions at the end and the easiest way for us to kind of pull those out or sort those out of the comments is with super chats. So if you do a super chat, it's why, um, everybody started doing a lot of super chats and we really appreciate that, which is why we cut off the advertisement, um, part. So there are no ads in the live version. If you aren't watching this live, sorry, there are ads. It's YouTube, but yes, I think that's. But to, I, I don't know if we mentioned, to get entered for the med kit giveaway. It's pinned to the top, and it is giveaway at gmail.com. So there's the email address. And put your name in the subject line. Then at the end of the show, at the end tonight, we are going to do a random number generator in order of emails, countdown, and then announce who won. You get a limited amount of time to claim your prize because we're not going to sit here all night. And then if you don't claim it, we'll pick another person. But hopefully you stick with us to the end so you have a chance to gain some really awesome knowledge um, that we're going to be talking about with foreign body infections, answer some questions, and then get you a med kit. Absolutely. So where, where are we at with the notes, dear? I have notes so that we don't forget where we're doing. Mm. So basically talking about (coughs) foreign body infections, that is tonight's topic. Yeah, so it's a a big one. And the way that we're going to be able to go through this here is a couple different things. First and foremost, we're going to talk about what we mean by foreign body infections, how they could affect your dogs, ways that your dogs could actually find and run into them, um, how to kind of... First and foremost, what they are. Then we've got a few stories um, that we can go over, some with happier endings than others. and Share our experiences so that you guys can hopefully learn from them. Then we're going to make a call in to a good buddy who has also had a lot of experience with this, just to kind of compare and contrast situations. And um, <sighs> then we're going to answer questions. It's uh, let's, let's get into it. So first and foremost, 
grass on infections, foreign body infections, what do we mean? So in the, the broad spectrum aspect of things, foreign body infection would be anything that's not supposed to be inside the dog that is inside the dog that causes an infection and their body is trying to get rid of it. So that's foreign body infection. What we are specifically dealing with on a regular Typically. basis, yeah, with our hunting dogs is some form of grass on or plant based material because I've seen infections from cacti needles. We've seen infections from sticks, seeds. S- yeah, uh, that piece of reed. I mean, that's technically a bad deal too. So, all kinds of different things, but plant based material and then even more specifically, grass on infections are some of the worst that we deal with because they're the sneakiest. All right. Um, most of the, th- most of the time when you have a foreign body infection, there's usually some form of obvious visual trauma or something, right? Like, uh, they have a stick poked into them. Well, they end up with a cut cause it came from the outside and went to the inside or something. And part of that stick might've broke off or the yeah. bark got left in there. Uh, even the, the, the porcupine quills, right? Yep. So those can be those, foreign body infections as well. Yep. Create foreign body infections. Part breaks off or the dog breaks one off digging at it. And then that pops out with a pussy pocket later. So some things easier to deal with than others. But with these grass on infections, a lot of times what can happen is they get in. Uh, if you've got a longer coated dog, they'll weave into the coat of the dog. And then the crazy thing about it. So it's not a grass seed. This is a common mistake, but misunderstanding, misunderstanding. Yep. So the, the on is actually the part fox tails. Yep. That's popped in there. That's one of them. So, um, the on is the part that actually, and anybody that knows more about this, correct me if I'm wrong, but the on is the part that is designed to help transfer the seed around. So seed lives inside the on to begin with. And the most ons, some worse than others, are barbed. And that can stick into the coat and then work in. They can get in their ears and then work all the way down. And then the end of those are also barbed. They're designed to stick to stuff to transfer seeds around. That's what yeah. their goal is. So um, when we have dogs actually running through the grass, they can inhale them. They can get them stuck between their pads. They can get them weaved into their coat like I was talking about. Ears. Eyes, nose, all, all the places, the anywhere that they kind of get weaseled into, and then they just continue to like barb My, things. They, contri- they continue to migrate. To migrate, yep. yeah. And the hard part about it is that cheat grass as well. Yes, cheat's another one. Yep. So the hard part about it is most of the time these cracks and crevices they hide in, and then they live there for a long time. Okay, they then can migrate and they follow tracks where it could get in between the toes, work all the way up the dog's leg into their chest cavity. They can inhale them and they work in through their lungs and chest cavity. Um, Somebody else says a two inch thorn in the paw uh, that probably lived there for a little while before you recognize because our dogs are tough. They hide all of this stuff. It's very difficult. So things like Ethan was saying, like you see a puncture wound or something between the paw Um, or in their side, those things are fairly obvious. Um, And typically, you go to the vet, they're going to throw you on some antibiotics. Um, That is going to take care of the problem, unless there's like a little piece of that plant matter still left in their body. And then once they come off antibiotics, give them a little bit of time, that creates another infection and it could be in the same area it could have migrated Um, ultimately the body is a pretty awesome weapon and it's trying to fight off that infection and expel it from the body so that's where you get these abscesses and pus pockets and things because those foreign bodies are trying to be pushed out in some place and then they get expelled in those ways, but they don't always get pushed out or it takes a really long time for them to get pushed out. And then in that process, they're causing a lot of damage internally. So we've talked about specifically now what the foreign body infections are. We've got lots of people that have had experienced some of this stuff already. And then um, what we're talking about the most is going to be those grass on infections and why we wanted to bring this up because we've heard of a few situations here even very recently that people have had to deal with this. Um, but at the same time, it's 
um, the kind of the process of how it works is your grass grows and then the seed head comes out and that has the awns carrying the seeds and then they start to dry down toward the end of the summer. We've had a hotter, drier summer here anyhow, so things are drying down faster. And when they dry down, that's when they're hard, they break off, they fall off, they are easier to get picked up by dogs, whether that's weaseled in someplace or inhaled or swallowed or whatever else. So, And then, um, like I was mentioning, so if you have those distinctive puncture entry points that's a little bit easier to follow the path follow the process what happens and Ethan had kind of hinted at this about these grass ons that are inhaled a lot of times are the sneaky ones because you don't necessarily know that there's a problem going on until your dog starts acting a little off and that's typically a little off all it starts at Mm -hmm. you know we've got these Sporting breeds, they're athletes, they're very strong, they're in great shape, great condition, and tough as nails. I mean, they can be very severely injured, unfeeling well, and it takes a lot to put them down. It takes a lot to change their bubbly, high-energy temperament. Um, And as owners that know our dogs very, very well, we have to advocate for them because not all veterinarians know the personalities of our breeds. Uh, They don't always know that our dogs, um, you know, shouldn't actually act all that calm when they go to the vet. Uh, And they're like, oh, well, they're just behaving really well. Well, no, they're basically acting completely off of their normal, um, you know, get crazy excited when we go to the vet and jump all over the vet techs and stuff. So when you know that your dog is acting not right. You need to advocate for them. Whether you're dealing with a foreign body infection or something else, you just have to say, hey, I know something is not going right, and we have to figure out and get to the bottom of what it actually is. Yep. So um, we've talked about the ons themselves, and that's where we run into the biggest issue with our dogs being upland hunting dogs primarily. And every area has different things, so you need to do a little research. We've had a few people mention some stuff already, but um, a few of the things being cheatgrass, foxtail, um, rye grass, um, Canadian wild rye being one, but lots of different subspecies of rye grass are horrible. Um, We have um, wild rye and or triticalia, or triticale, however you say that exactly, Um, It's like a wheat rye hybrid that grows out here a lot. And we've had a lot of issues with those getting into the dog's ears and stuff. They're super, super barbed. If you ever wonder, is this one that's dangerous, you can grab it. And if you just run kind of like the opposite direction of the, how the seed head or the on is shaped, um, you'll feel that it's barbed. Okay. But all of these different things are going to be area specific and you need to kind of learn what they look like as well as the specific time in your area that they're dangerous because they're not dangerous all year round. And typically by hunting season, most of these things are gone. They've been all knocked off by wind and storms and whatever else and it's dried down enough. By the time you get into October, November, December, there's not much left in the danger zone. It's in the danger zone. Um, you end up more dangerous like end of July, August, September time frame right now, okay? When you're trying to train in the summer and get your dogs right. ready yeah. for hunting season, when you're trying to condition them, Absolutely. Um, that's when they're going to have the most exposure at the worst time. So basic overview, I think we've got a pretty good idea of what um, grass ons are, how dogs, how they could be potentially dangerous for dogs. And now we want to talk about a few different examples um, of our firsthand experience with this. Um, first and foremost, I'm going to tell the story of Shooter One. I don't think we've ever told this story on Yawa. Maybe not. I don't think so. Not very many people know this. So we have Shooter. He's on our website. He's we our just posted on. a picture of him on Instagram and Facebook just a couple days ago of... And he's the thumbnail image for this video he was. So I don't know if you saw that, Kat. I'm yes, sure. I did see that. Did you? Yeah. Come on, pat me on the back. I like you did a good job Whip that, that together thumbnail. real quick like, whoo, baby. So um, anyhow, Shooter One. Don't recycle names, folks. It gets real confusing. Because the picture and everything that we're talking about is actually technically Shooter Two, who yeah. he is um, just about 
nine. He'll be nine here in October. You always get to celebrate his birthday in South Dakota with him. Um, and this will be the ninth year that you're up there. So that all makes sense. But um, every year, Shooter 2 gets an ice cream cone in winter South Dakota, baby. Yes, but original Shooter, Shooter 1, who was actually black and white, um, and Nix's full brother from a different litter. Um, yep. So same breeding, different litter that Nix is out of. That was Shooter 1. And he was our first experience with a foreign body grass on infection. Um, we're going to give you the Reader's Digest version so you know where we're headed with this story. This is not a good ending. He died at 18 months old, okay? Now, the reason that he died was um, essentially veterinarians not understanding enough about this or what's going on and pushing us away over and over and over again. So, the As first well as, like I mentioned, these dogs are really tough. So by the time that we truly recognized how sick he was, he was very sick. sick. So it all started uh, a few days before he turned 18 months old. I think maybe five days would be the exact calendar time. And he was running. We were prepping for advanced stuff. Uh, I wanted to run him in utility as well as a, in Master Hunter. And it, we'd been doing a bunch of duck search stuff and doing a bunch of training. He was running um, in the field that day working on steady wing shot and fall training. And he looked off. I just felt like, hmm, and I remember coming home specifically and talking to Kat about it. I was like, he just seemed off today. I don't know what was going on with him. He just seemed off. Not himself, not full force, okay? So people have off days. Dog has off days. Don't think too much of it. And the next day he was scheduled for his um, rabies and routine checkup. And I thought, well, I'll mention it. Well, we get in there, and he weighed at that point in time he had gained five pounds, which I was like, oh, wow, you don't really look like you've gained five pounds, but you've gained five pounds. You're cool. maturing. You're filling yeah, out, muscling out, you know. It's gradual enough change. Huh. Um, but he got his rabies shot. Then the next day, we started to see, um, like, his abdomen area was kind of distended. Bloated he looked looking. Bloated, yep. So we're now into the... Third day of third day noticing of this symptoms. Yep. So from seemed a little off to still seemed pretty low key at the vet to the next morning had a distended abdomen. So we went back to the vet and I said, so, hey, uh, I know we were just here yesterday. He doesn't look good. He looks bloated. This is very strange. And so they did an x-ray and they saw that there was food in his stomach and they said, does he have any puppy food around that he could have gotten into or something? I'm like, uh, sure. So I let them talk me into that, even though I am like 99% knew that there was no chance for him to get anything because we have food in containers. They're very structured meal Very times. structured it's life. no free feed. Everything. No. Yeah. Load up in the truck, go to work with me, go train, get back. I mean, he never has been out of my sight in the entire day. So... They said that, and they sent us home with, give him some time, he'll be fine. He'll, cool. he'll digest and pass all that food, bloat will go away. Yep, sure. I trusted him, 100%. Makes sense, right? He could have, he could have, whatever. Maybe. Um, and by that evening, um, he was acting super off. and To the point where he was, like, just standing, staring, panting, labored, breathing, not good. And we're like... Something is wrong with this dog. We need to get to an emergency vet now. Yeah, he was just standing, staring at the wall, basically. And um, so we went to an emergency vet clinic that night, and his abdomen is still distended, right? And pe they looked at him and went, wow, this really looks bad, and he doesn't look good. I'm like, yeah, I know. That's why we're here. It's uh, not looking good. They checked gums. They did not um, have good capillary refill. Uh, his temperature was actually low at this point, signs of onset of shock at this point. Um, they did an ultrasound of his abdomen and again, misdiagnosed and told us that he looked like he had a perforated bladder. R yeah, ruptured. Ruptured bladder. There yeah, you go. I think they said, which um, so that you guys know, and this is some of the things that we just kind of glanced over some of these things. And I'm, after we get done with this story, we're going to go over some of the things that you should be looking at when you're checking, how you can, you know, check out your own dog a little bit. Um, but so they said ruptured bladder. Okay. Um, 
And I have now since done research to find out that rupturing a bladder is very, 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 very uncommon. It happens in things like when dogs get hit by cars, okay? So pretty insane trauma, and even then, very uncommon in... To only have that specific All The problem. only thing that's wrong with you is you ruptured your bladder. Yeah. And um, again, I was like, I don't know. I mean, may- maybe he jumps into the back of the truck. <laughs> we had don't no know. idea. We're like, maybe he missed the tailgate one time, and I have no idea, right? Yeah, so... Talking uh, ourselves into, yeah, this whatever. could be the case. They said, we'll we need s- to stabilize him before we can do bladder surgery in the morning. And, he's and not doing they would well. be sending us to a specialist Yep. Um, at a special facility, not their emergency center. They would stabilize him overnight. We would pick him up in the morning and go to... Um, it was called Blue, Blue Pearl. Pearl. Yeah. Which was about two hours away from where the emergency... It's two hours away from our house, about an hour, hour. away from the emergency clinic. So yes. we went home. Didn't really sleep well. Got back up at what, like five o'clock? I mean, we were probably we're, in bed for three or four hours. Yeah, not long. Um, got back up, drove back down there, and they're like, oh, we've got him stabilized and he's ready to go in for surgery. Well, the dude couldn't walk out of the clinic. He I looked mean, worse than when we had brought him in. He came in. He Like, we, I was walking him out, and he f- fell over. I had to pick him up and carry him into the car. Um, we drove... Down I to the clinic. sat in the back seat with him yep. as he's laboring and... And hit every single red light on the way there. It's yeah, just, just it, how it works, it's, right? And that's how it always seems like it works. And he is... We're to the point now that I don't know if we're actually going to make it to the emergency specialist, Blue Pearl. Yeah, it's a bad deal. Very, very, very scary. And we get into... Um, we get into the... Blue Pearl facility, and they take him from me, carrying him in there, and they come back out, and they start us with some paperwork and whatever, and they're like, he has fluid around his heart. We need to drain that. And they're then waiting for me to scribble my signature on to make sure that I've there, I'm approving them to... And we'll you know, pay for it. And yeah. we'll pay for it, which we like. They think their initial estimate was like three grand or something like that, and just to walk through the door, basically. But it's... Um, and at that point in time, I mean, it was it was bad news bears. We're looking at this going, I don't know how the hell we're going to pay for this. But Looking at care credit, all of those options yeah. to help pay for things yeah. because um, it's going to be expensive. It already has been expensive with the routine vet visits. Routine vet. Then the emergency vet visit. Which was like 1500 bucks. Yep. And then Thousand, now on to a specialist, bucks. right? So yeah, and they're quoting us three grand walking through the door and we're choking down five grand already and we haven't done anything um really and so they they come back in they drain the fluid off his heart they pulled a liter of fluid from around his heart a liter of cola folks it's a lot right two liter bottle that's big liter that's half of that but still a lot and then they also pulled two more liters of fluid from two his abdomen. Liters. So he had three liters of fluid in his wasn't abdominal just and puppy chest food, cavity. Folks. It wasn't, wasn't puppy just food. puppy food. So, um, and now granted, please don't, this is not me hating on veterinarians, okay? I'm just saying we're getting into the you got to advocate for your dogs and understand some of these things. We're going to give you more of that. And the more educated you are about potential things that truly could be affecting your dog, the more questions you can ask, the more you can advocate. Because most vets don't see a ton of hunting, sporting, athletic bred dogs. You know, they see a variety. And so they don't have as much experience. And then the specialists um, at some of these universities have seen more of these type of things. Yeah. But your small town vet probably hasn't seen many of them. Um, and So, fluid around his heart, right? Uh, what is that? It's called a pericardial infusion. And pericardial infusions are caused by a number of different things. They have um, severe infection. That's one cause. Trauma. That's another cause. And then I think the third main one, maybe there's a fourth. Don't, I mean, throw in some stuff in there. I'm, I'm definitely interested in knowing if you know more about this. But um, the third was just like random pericardial infusions. But basically what had happened and what we were seeing for the full day before is that he had a pericardial infusion. 
that fluid up. was overflowing, basically backed up into his abdomen. Yep. And so much fluid. So that fluid was constricting his heart, making it have to what, work so what, what much harder to here? be able to beat and push blood where it needed to go. Um, his body was a mess at this point. Um, and just trying to get him stabilized, truly stabilized, and figure out what was going on was um, uh, the battle that we were dealing with. And they definitely needed to um, get that fluid pulled off, which he bounced back. He seemed to bounce back. You know, we, we both had jobs. We had a lot of things that the dog needed to go through testing-wise. We couldn't just sit in the waiting room all day waiting. So I'm throwing this out there, too, just because I looked up the stats real quick. A liter of fluid weighs approximately two and a half pounds. So Makes sense why he was an extra five pounds heavier, huh? Uh, he had, in less than 24 hours, had enough fluid that he was showing visu visual distendedness, bloat in his gut. So he had five, because, I mean, we were like... Super on top of everything. I, I was, I knew he weighed five pounds more than what he should at that vet appointment. But I was like talking myself out of the fact that, oh, he's just gaining muscle or something, right? So he already had five pounds worth of fluid in his body that he was kind of, his body was kind of hiding, right? He didn't know it was there. So then um, after, let me get back here to where I'm supposed to be. Um, after Kat said he bounced back, they called us. They, we, we left him there. Like, they drained the fluid. They said, well, it's going to take some time. And then they started running. Um, they started running. They ran blood work and did some different things. Doing and some more testing, trying yeah. to figure out what's causing this fluid. Right? Yep. And I don't remember the exact turn of events, but I know that this was really early in the morning. And then we had to go to work. Oh, so they figured out, yeah, they just told us, well, I'm just, it's been a while. It's like 12, 13 years ago. So um, they, th while they were there, they drained the fluid. He started to bounce back. And during that process, they ran blood work. They did all of the things. This, this is the clinic that was like, we will tell you exactly why your dog is sick. And um, then they found that he had an infection in his lungs. That's what caused it. Okay, they said, okay, severe infection. That's what's going on here. So they put in drain tubes yep. and again had to get him to the point of stabilized enough for surgery. So they wanted to stabilize him overnight. They said, get out of here. We'll keep you updated. We got a call. They said, uh, you know, he's Things getting aren't better. He's not getting better. He's getting better. He's not getting better. It was kind of the game that was played all day long. And then um, we came back that next morning, right? That night. They that called night. pretty late saying, hey. He's we don't think taking he's going to make it, Yeah, right? he's kind of taking a turn for the worse, uh, not looking like we're going to be getting him stabilized. Do you guys want to come see him? And we were like, absolutely. So we went, and we stayed with him for a while. Um, and he perked up from that. To see us there, yeah. of course. You know, Dad we're his, day. We're his people. And um, just being there made him feel better. But he was not out of the woods. Um, and they were like, at this point, he's as stable as we're going to get him. Yeah. Your options are try for surgery or say goodbye. Th you know, that's kind of where we're at. We're going to have to open him up, try and clean out all of this infection out of his chest cavity, um, and hope he pulls through surgery. And we're like, now, at, at this point, folks, this is where I get like chills and shaky and everything just thinking about how horrible this was okay so this is a dog that was so full of life and, and potential i mean everything. we were so excited for him um he was also a pain in the ass sorry for the language but um, it's really easy to forget the things when they're gone that they did that was aggravating and you just kind of stick to uh the good things um, yes, I believe they did a CT scan as well during this process. And that's probably how they found the infection in the exactly fluid. Exactly where it lungs. was. Yeah. Then used um, an ultrasound, I believe, as well to help drain the completely pinpoint exactly where to go in uh, for drain tubes and everything else. They did everything that they could. Had we gotten him there maybe four days earlier, I think we'd have a different outcome. But um, so he was he had an infection that was so bad for such an extended period of time at this, and it sounds like maybe not that long, but this was brewing for a while, folks. Before we even, before we saw even symptoms, knew. probably. Yep. 
So, and he was essentially in either medicine induced sleep state or was kind of kicked over to coma esque something. He was not, he was not kicking it very well anymore. And they said, we can try and do surgery or um, we can put him down. I mean, these are the two options. And we're like, well, how much is surgery going to cost? And they gave us a quote for surgery of 10,000 to $15,000, I think. Ten to fifteen thousand dollars was on top of everything that we've already mentioned. So we're in the vicinity of thirteen to eighteen grand at this point. And folks, oh, it was it was hard. It's one of those things that it's like you're you're far enough into this, and and the, they're your dog. You love them. You care about them. And he's young, and he has so much potential. We All said, things. let's try. Yeah. So I mean, we said, well, we have to try. I, I feel like we have to try, right? And um, he, he didn't, didn't make, make anesthesia. Uh, they they went to put him under for surgery, completely under for surgery, and he died. That yeah. was it. So, um, and it was it was awful. Okay. It was um, very difficult. Um, you know, our first dog that we had the option to take to the level that we wanted. Um, Sammy, God love her. She's still around. Crazy Sammy, our first short hair. But she she wasn't the dog that we wanted to to, perf- to take to those levels. Um, she wasn't capable of taking to those levels, truly. Um, we learned a lot from her. We learned a lot from Shooter. Um, a lot of things that allowed us to be more aware of what was going on and to be able to advocate for our dogs in the future. And Shooter is what helped us save Nix, Vex, and Muddy, um, as well as Holly and sharing information with other people we have helped advocate for when we've heard of situations going on and pushing for more information. Um, Some dogs have been too far gone and they've um, also passed away of us knowing about the situation too late to push for them, um, but helped save some other dogs. And um, that's why we want to talk about this, because there are so many things that you may not know that vets may not think of as being an option. And if you don't push and you don't ask, this could be your story. Sorry, that was uh, a lot more to talk about that than I expected it would be. It's been a while since we talked about him. Yep. So... Um, so now let's talk about the specific things that you can be looking for. Uh, first and foremost, if you think your dog is off, not acting themselves, think about the things that are happening around that situation. Did you just do a bunch of exercise, hunting trip, uh, change in your routine, change in anything? Has anything changed? If the answer to that is no, then the first thing that we want to do is um, check their temperature. That is the number one thing. And we get a lot of folks that call in, buddies, um, clients, anything else. Hey, um, what is, uh, you know, my dog's doing this, something, 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 something. And my answer is always, have you checked their temperature yet? It's the number one thing we would do with any of the dogs in the kennel that are acting a little off too. Number one thing, if a dog's acting a little off, having a little more diarrhea, or not eating as well as they normally do, being a little lazier, more lethargic, first thing, check their temperature. Yep. Um, A dog's normal temperature. Does anybody know? Drum roll, please. That's a quiz. Yeah. So uh, we'll give you a second to work on that, but what is a dog's normal temperature? And then, yes, uh, Charles, who we're going to call in a second, mentioned, we just mentioned the ones that we specifically, like, own Um. and everything else. And then um, Charlie here has had... Three, four, five, six dogs or so that he specifically has had issues with. They have a lot of rye where he trains and does a lot of training, spends a lot of time in the field. So, um, anyhow, the... Uh, yep, and Adam, that's Piper. Piper, who's got too. a litter of puppies, yeah. In her neck, right? I'm pretty sure it was right, her right, neck, right, right. yeah. Yep. Um, I was like, she's not feeling good. She's probably got a foreign infection going on, so... Yeah. Um, Things that you should be looking for is a temperature. Yep. So I'm going to help you out here. 100.5 to 103.5 is what is the considered normal for dogs. Now, I want to caveat that with 
check your dog's temperature on a regular, semi-regular, not every day. Um, even if you just do a couple times throughout months or whatever, get a baseline, right? What are their normal temperature? Our dogs are 100.5 to 101.5. If they're anything outside of that range, like they have 102.5? a fever. Like 102.5? 102.5 is a low-grade fever and is headed in the direction. In our of, dogs. In our dogs. So if we see anybody at 102.5, we know that there's something wrong. Now, if they were just running around, that can elevate a degree yeah. or two. I'll check their temperature again. Check it again in an hour or so, okay? Once they've had a time to cool down. Not an ear thermometer. Um, it does need to be taken rectally for the dogs. Up the bum. Yep, yep. So yep. probably not the one you want to stick in your medicine cabinet afterwards. Yeah, come on, live a little. So um, what we end up doing there, checking temperature first. Um, Kat had mentioned something about gums. So your dog gums should be pink, reddish to pinkish, depending on how hot they are. You can push on the gum, push pressure. It should immediately look white when you take your finger off and then go right back to pink or red. Capillary refill. And the reason that Shooters was um, not refilling well was he was his body was in the process of trying to shut down already. Yeah, it he was, was already in shock. Sh- he yeah. was in shock. Um, and if you're to that point, that's pretty serious um, by that point. Now, um, that is not necessarily a sign of a foreign body infection. That is a sign that your dog is in very poor health, um, and you should be seeking emergency veterinary care. Um, so we talked about shooter one and the experience we had with him and the constant not knowing and the vet not knowing. And I think that it would be fitting to share our experience with Nick's. We don't have to share every single situation with Vex and Muddy as well, but, um, why knowing your dog advocating for them is so important because Nick's was a similar situation where just seemed off. He didn't free run as hard, and I was like, "No, the first si- yes, the sign. F- the first sign was he didn't he, eat as fast. He ate his bowl of food slower. Not didn't eat. He ate his bowl of food slower. So you know, you guys all know we've got a lot of dogs, right? So our routine: fill their bowls of food, bowl of food, next crate, bowl of food, next crate, bowl of food. Go around, and then as soon as I finished feeding all seven, eight, nine, ten dogs. I go and pick up bowls, and literally by the time I have finished handing out the last bowl, the first dog is done eating, Uh, and it was not done. Nix was slow. He was still working on it, but he wasn't eating as fast, and I said something to Ethan. I'm like, Nix ate slow tonight. It was Christmas Eve, I think, so we're doing our appetizer deal. It was the day before Christmas Eve, so that was my first sign that I was like, Nix seemed off. He didn't eat as fast. And we're like, well, let's watch him. Let's keep an eye on him pretty close. And um, I think we went for a free run, and he didn't work as hard the next day. And that next was Chris- morning. Yep, and yep. that was Christmas Eve day. Yep. So then that night, um, we do a big family appetizer um, Christmas Eve tradition, which when the dogs are out and about, what do you think they're trying to do? Uh, steal snacks, right? I mean, steal bag snacks, a little bit. Scrounge a little bit. Yeah. Be like, look how cute I am. I could eat a pretzel, you know. And Nick stayed curled up on his dog bed. I'm like, well, that's not normal. 100%. Like, you turn your back, he may try and counter surf. That's, that's what Nick's is like. And so I knew immediately, I was like, something is wrong with Nick's. He was cal- super <coughs> calm all evening, um, which, sure, it's sweet. It's, it's fun to have a sweet, calm dog. You know, when your kids are sick and they're not running around rampant and they want to snuggle a little bit more, that's the exact same thing it was like with Nick's being not himself. 100%. So we're like, okay, he's not doing good. So we took his temperature. He had a slight fever elevated from what his norm would be. He was like 102 something. Yep. And I said, he's got to have a foreign body infection. There's nothing else visual going on. Um, He hasn't been having icky stool. I mean, this is, I, I'm like, he's got to have a foreign body infection. That was my, my first thought. And we're like, okay, what are we going to do? Well, we are lucky enough to have some antibiotics on hand. So we started him on antibiotics that night. Mm -hmm. Because I'm like, it's Christmas Eve, you guys. I mean, where are we going to be able to get him in um, at at this juncture? We'll start him on antibiotics. We'll reevaluate. You know, hopefully Christmas Day he's fine and we can get him in somewhere. Well, 
that night, the dogs are all sleeping in the bedroom with us, and I was laying there, and I'm a pretty light sleeper, but I could hear Nick's breathing, and I'm not exaggerating and going, oh, I'm th- I think I hear him breathing. No, he sounded raspy, and then I'm like, well, what do the other dogs sound like? Quiet breathing. I would listen to them, just normal quiet breath sounds. I listen to Nick's, it sounds labored. It sounds like he is struggling to breathe, and it brought me all the way back to Shooter One and the experience that we had with him, and I didn't sleep all night. I stayed listening to him breathe all night, was up super early Christmas Day, and said, we need to take him somewhere. I know it's Christmas Day. Where do we go, right? What's the options? I don't want to have to put people out on Christmas Day. There's got to be an option. So we went to um, an emergency animal hospital in Wichita, and they didn't believe us. (laughs) And I am saying you have to advocate for your dogs because I get it's Christmas Day. Nobody wants to be at the emergency vet clinic. Nobody wants to be missing their families. Um, us as included, I don't want to put people out, but I also know my dog, and we got there, and Nick's laid down on the floor of the exam room, crossed his paws like he does, just chill. The vet comes in, does an exam. He doesn't have a raging temperature, remember, he's 1027, and they're like, well, he doesn't really have a fever. I'm like, well, but really, we did start him on antibiotics already, and he still has a slightly elevated temperature for what is normal for our dogs, and they're like, okay. Uh, I said, well, we'd really like to run blood work and get at least a chest x-ray started. Um, We also know you have a CT scan. Um, You know, I looked up um, online, and they do have a CT machine. So I wanted to utilize those things um, and get ahead on this. And they said, well, he just doesn't seem sick, guys. I'm like, no, 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 no. You don't understand. This is a young German short hair pointer at a vet clinic being all loved up on by the vet techs and excited and he's just laying here chill, calm, well-behaved, right? I'm like, this is not normal. Excuse the language, but he's normally kind of an asshole. He'd be bouncing around, pulling at the end of his leash, trying to jump up on people because that's what they do in these exciting situations, right? I'm like, he's sick. And so I kept pushing, kept advocating. They're like, okay, well, you guys can go home. We'll, you know, we'll run blood work. We'll get an x-ray. And then when we get a chance to evaluate the blood work and the x-ray, we'll let you know. Okay. I don't think I don't and they think sent we us went home. home. No, they sent us home. We came back Christmas Day, waited for the blood work to come in. Um, and I immediately was on the phone with K State though, because I'm like, they basically are brushing us off. Well they told us that they only reserve the C T machine for dogs that are actually sick. That was what the lady said. And I mean I, I get what situations happen, but those were her exact words. Uh, we aren't going to do a CT. We only do that on dogs that are actually sick. That's a giant waste of our time. So. Yeah, and, and their resources. And I, I do understand she didn't believe that we knew our dog was sick. And in her opinion, he didn't appear sick. So we did get the blood work and the x-ray done. We went home. I was immediately on the phone to K-State. Um, we went that day. We were there the same day. They wouldn't get us in until the next morning. We went on the 26th. Okay. Um, And I left and was there first thing in the morning, um, and I basically advocated, said what I thought it was. Um, They did their own. They did their own X-rays, and they said, "Yeah, that doesn't look good. There's a lot of shadowing in his lungs that shouldn't be there. His blood work doesn't look good, even being on antibiotics." Okay, we're gonna get him in. um, They did surgery on the 27th. Yep, we're gonna get him in for a CT scan tomorrow morning. And because they wanted to do one anesthetic event, basically, they said, we'd like to put him under for the CT scan. And then if he needs surgery, move him straight to surgery. If he doesn't, wake him up, all good. But they didn't want to put him under for the CT scan on the 26th, then have to re-put him under on the 27th. So they waited, called me with the results of the CT scan, said, yes, definitely huge infection brewing in his lungs. Um, We can see some places um, that there's definitely infection, necrotic tissue, and so they did open chest cavity surgery on him. They actually removed a lobe of his lungs, which at that time, I did not know that dogs have five lobes of their lungs, um, and 
I was like, oh my gosh, he's going to lose a whole lobe of his lung. How is thinking he ever? Half, yeah, right? thinking half. I was like, how is he ever going to recover from something like this? I'm like, what kind of quality of life is he going to have? <laughs> and they explained to me that dogs have five lobes, um, and most dogs can recover fully with two third lung capacity. Um, so they could lose up to two lobes of their lungs, which Muddy has lost two lobes of her lungs from a foreign body infection. Um, but yeah, he went so the dog that was not sick on the 25th um, ended up having I mean surgery on the 27th. Open chest cavity surgery, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So and then has, there's a long recovery period where they have to wait for chest tubes to stop draining. They have to, you know, he has to be stitched up. They all have to um, be on eight weeks of basically bed rest, on leash only, no up and down stairs, no jumping on furniture because his chest cavity is wired closed and that needs to heal properly. Yep. Um, and so that's one of the things that I wanted to talk with Charlie about specifically because they've had some changes here. So um, all of that being said, we went through that process. We bypassed a lot of the other stuff um, with Muddy and Vex. Because we knew. And the other side of things is... Um, the difference between, you, know, <laughs> you got censored there for saying idiots. Uh, I don't know if you're talking about us. I doubt it. I hope that you were talking about the vets. But if it was us, I mean, eh, okay, whatever. fine. It, everybody's got an opinion, right? So the um, what I was getting at, though, with the difference is you were talking about the same similar day-ish time period, right? But day one, first, second, we started on antibiotics, Okay. So we, as soon as we saw things starting to ramp up, we were able to kind of knock it back a little bit, which bought us some time. So key is um, being timely with all of this, right? Yep. And um, Muddy, we noticed after she didn't take from her litter, so she was fighting an infection for a while, and then went on a free run and was doggy. Like, run, like three minutes in, she was walking in front of the mule, like this isn't right. Check her temperature. We went and run blood work. Her white blood cell counts through the roof. Infection. Can't see anything. Obviously, it's inside. Foreign body infection. She had two lobes removed. Okay. Um, bad deal. And Bex then had been fighting it for months. He Bex was doggy. For months. Yes. I was training him for utility testing, um, which I'm not making excuses for my dog. I get They get the score that they get, but he had no stamina when it came to his duck search. He couldn't stay out there for 10 minutes. He was literally trying to die. Um, and so we got him back, got him on antibiotics, still ended up going to K-State. He's the only dog that we've had have open cavity surgery that has not lost a lobe of his lung, but they found 13 seats. 13 ons. Th 13 yeah. ons, excuse me, yep. in his chest cavity in his lung tissue, in his chest wall cavity, um, chest wall cavity, everything got those cleaned out. So um, it's a problem for sure. And knowing what to look for, knowing how to advocate for your dog is really important. And I think that we should probably um, call Charles and yep. have him share because the, the last experience we had with this was with um, Vex. And that was almost three years ago because we lit – and. I love my dogs. I also love my children. We literally had to go pick Vex up um, from K-State a couple days after Aiden was born. So yeah. uh, coming on three years ago. So things change. Medicine changes. Um, and I definitely think that um, Charles' experience will shed a little light on um, potential new procedures. So Yeah. And so the, the last thing to talk about with, ooh, he's got pictures. Oh, that was one of JC's. That was probably. Yuck, that's so gross. <laughs> I don't know if that's going to be able to show. Uh, turn your head away for a second. I think it's pulling eyeballs. See if I How do I know if it focused if I close my eyes? <laughs> it's not focused. Know. I don't know. <laughs> uh, no, no. I can't figure it out. Let me see here. I'll figure that out in a second. Um. Uh, so we talked about our experiences shooter one sucked i mean it was very expensive we went to the blue pearl facility which granted they did all of the things right and if that's your only option opt for one of those somebody else mentioned like a guardian there's a bunch of private um and they have board certified they have all of the stuff everything yep but they're, expensive. they're private 
Yeah, yep. they're expensive. So we spent just over ten thousand dollars for shooter one to die, which sucked. Um, then Vex and Nix and Muddy's surgeries all cost almost uh, exactly the same at K State, which was like what seven eight thousand dollars. Yeah, I think that all of them were under eight thousand. Yep. So seventy, roughly seventy five hundred dollars per dog, and um. What they found specifically, this is an interesting one because Indian grass um, is Isn't very, very common. is necessarily considered. It doesn't have a quote-unquote mean seed, um, but this is what they found in Vex. They, we didn't find any, any material in Muddy, so whatever it was, the infection had already gotten rid of all of the plant matter. And Nix, they found like small amounts of maybe plant matter, but it was already, it was migrating and doing different things. And, and the body works to break it down a lot yes. of times too, so that it can expel it. Um, so, but, but also I'm sure Charles will share here, that stuff can linger forever. Forever. Um, poor Trig. So, yeah. so um, all of that being said, the, if you had the opportunity for a veterinarian and, or a vet school, excuse me, um, they have all of the, the equipment, all of the things, all of the stuff there. And in every experience that we've dealt with, they are less expensive than these private places. So if you have the option, um, and then the next thing was with that specifically, you just drive and you show up. If you call for an appointment, they aren't going to make an appointment. You're going to the emergency clinic aspect of things. So the, um, <laughs> it says Minnesota is safer for dogs. Is Minnesota safer for oh, dogs? Well, Minnesota is where, that's shooter, where shooter one, one died. Yeah. So that's where we were living at the time with shooter one. So no, it's um, more the time frame, and yep. it's lots of training late summer, which is when all of this stuff has happened. So um, it's it's just one of those things that and it can take a while for the infection to brew up. So we train late summer. Yep. Well, Vex was November. Nix was. December, Christmas, and Muddy was also in December. So definitely they were fighting those infections. Their body was working on it for quite a while. For quite a while before we actually saw the true symptoms that we were able to to get the, them in for care. Um, so time of year can can definitely play a role. The type of grass that you're in. Um, I saw somebody throw in there that you know they can you can wear those masks on the dogs, um, but when we're training for dogs to retrieve and things like that it's hard for them to wear a mask and be able to do those retrieving things now if you're just conditioning Correct. and doing free runs running on one of those masks might not be a bad option yep. um so uh but just being aware of the grounds that you're you're doing a lot of your training in absolutely so um all it comes down to is being aware you know being aware for your dog being aware of your environment being aware of all of these things exist um Anytime you put your dog in the field, there are risks, okay? So we can't uh, put them in bubble wrap, you know, and I feel the same way about my kids, you know, like I want to help with everything. Well, yeah, they're going to fall, they're going to bump their knee, they're going to scrape, their knee, they're going to have some things that happen that might be bigger than a scraped knee, but ultimately you can't bubble wrap them. It's just not, it's but not doable. But being as so. aware and as safe as possible in those situations um, is, is, is all you can do, so... So I want to mention just a couple quick things, and we're going to give Charlie a call. Um, one of which I wanted to say for those, anybody that's just tuning in now or anything else, um, pinned at the top are the instructions for the giveaway. We have 145 people entered already, which is fantastic. Um, again, send an email to the email uh, listed there, Yawa Giveaway. It's, all, it's pinned to the top, all the instructions, 60 seconds once we pull a number at the end of this. And then um, you'll get a chance. And once you get that, then we'll we'll hit you up with an email and we'll make sure. Get your contact taken information care taken yep. care of. So. so let me see if we can make this happen. Phone a friend. Uh-huh. There, it's ringing. They'll be able to hear it too? Should be able to. Yeah. Okay. 100%. Hello. Hey, how are you? Good. Uh, everybody, this is Charles, Coulter, Charlie, uh, Candy Mountain, Charlie, how, whatever you want to call him. He's been on a previous Yawa before and a, a Bourbon and Bird Dogs before. so Absolutely. So we've been talking about, and I've seen you comment a few times on here, buddy, but 
Um, we've been talking about foreign body infections and specifically that, you know, our dogs, um, kind of the experiences that we ran into. And we just wanted, you know, we know you have uh, a lot of experience with this and we wanted to hear kind of some of the things that you saw because your foreign bodies primarily have been different. Your most recent is the first that you've actually had lung issues. Is that right? Yep. First one, um, not the first major surgery, but first one in the lung. Yep. Now tell us, uh, tell us a little bit about the other ones and kind of your history with migrators and what that looked, what you noticed, what kind of led to everything. Um, I think our first one was breezy and, um, that was probably, it was roughly a year long ordeal where she would get lethargic. And she also did have, um, on, in this case, this is even made her case a little harder. She did get a little lethargic and she did have some, um, abscesses on her side, mm-hmm. on her ribs, which is really, really, really common, um, for a migrating foreign body. So they looked in there, they found material, they removed it, said, you're good to go. Kept on antibiotics for, 14 days, I think, Batril and Clavamox. And, uh, Clavamox being are one that we've seen really, really good. Because um, basically when you look at antibiotics, you have, I think it's gram positive, gram negative, and I might be wrong with that, but you're essentially attacking two different types of um, aerobic bacteria. Aerobic and anaerobic. Yeah, that's also part of it. So um, different, you need different types of antibiotics sometimes because they don't always know what type of bacteria it is, and it takes a while to culture that to figure it out. So if you just attack it from both sides, then you're usually good. And Batril is one that's like super potent. potent stro- it's a strong antibiotic. And Clavamox is what we've been using primarily and have had really, really good luck with that. So, Yep, so they did all that, said, we got it. She's good to go. We found it. And um, it was probably three or four months later, maybe, that she was kind of acting again. She was down, um, breathing, uh, bubbly, would be a nice way to put it. Yeah, absolutely. And coming into the house and just, you know, curl up, lay down, get up. She was, um, I don't know if she slowed down on her food or not. It would take a lot for Breezy to slow down on her food. But, absolutely. Um we just noticed, again, she slowed down, took her back into the vet, and uh, her white blood count was high. And I can't remember the name. There's another white blood cell count they can look at, and it shows, like, how long it's been elevated. Oh, interesting. And that count was also, basically, it showed it had been high for a while. So they did another round of antibiotics and just said, well, maybe there's a little residual, and we'll see if her body can handle it. Um, you know, at that point, we're kind of like, well, we really would like a little more. And they're like, oh, we think we got it. So um, another round of antibiotics, breezy bounce back, good to go. Um, and then, it, again, it's like two, three months after she's off the antibiotics, back to the same lethargic breezy. So um, took her back to the vet, and he just said, you guys are probably right. This is out of my hands. Time to go to Iowa State. And so, the fact that um, your vet was able to be a big enough person to say, hey, I, I can't help you anymore. You need more help than I can give. That that says a lot. Yeah, and we're also, I mean, and also through all of this, we're talking to you guys. We're talking to anybody that, you know, what is going on. Sure, absolutely. Um, and so she went to Iowa State and um, – pretty shocking to get that quote the first time when they say this is what we want to do and this is um, what it's going to cost so, yeah so they said we need to do a ct or no, they did an mri with her actually which mri is supposed is supposed to be better for soft tissue stuff so right and so they did an mri and they found um which is kind of interesting is that the mri cost so much and it costs about just as much to have a specialist read the mri as it does to get mm-hmm. it uh, so, yep, they, they did the MRI, and they actually found it on, um, it was near her aorta, but it was in her, um, in the name of the cavity, where kidneys and intestines, that whole um, area. So, 
they saw that there was a, a wound track. They saw that something was going on. They said, yep, this is what it's going to be. Um, so they, they, we again said, yes, you know, you have to go and sign all the papers, give them a deposit. Um, and they did the surgery and followed the wound tracks and cleaned up as much of the infection as they could. They never found um, that foreign body, uh, which is unfortunately somewhat common, at least especially for us. We haven't had one yet where they've actually said, ha-ha, we, we have it. They didn't find um, any with Nick's as well. Um, no specific plant matter to pull out, um, yeah. whereas with Vex, they sure did. So, so And the wound track um, was very close to um, aorta, so they basically cleaned up what they could, and if I remember correctly, they believe it came through her diaphragm. So that one, she probably was one that she was fighting in her lungs, and then as we were keep getting her on antibiotics, she was able to, it was able to keep moving. So, um, she still has a couple lumps on her side that are probably encapsulated pieces. Um, and we're not, you know, nobody's going to touch them. Um, she's been great ever since. Um, sorry, hold on. <laughs> Annie, uh, Annie was knocking on wood. And if you know what happens when you knock around dogs, Sure, absolutely. <laughs> They're like, oh, somebody's at the door. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So that was breezy. Um, that one was a, a pretty big shock. I don't, I mean, I'll, I, we can, I'll talk cost. I think that one was like 4200 bucks, something like that. Which, yeah. Um, and you then know, you no, think about. No ventilator, no, none of the stuff that involves a lot of the really, um, you know, they, they we were prepared. The estimate they gave us was if we followed this wound track, and there's bad infection, and we have to go to the other side of our diaphragm, then we're going to have to put on our ventilator, and then it would have been the whole chest crack and, and yeah. everything. So we and, got lucky. But you also had other vet visits and expenses with you know, oh, multiple yeah, things yeah. leading up to that point, trying we to get We had a whole year. Care. I mean, yeah, yeah a whole year of, of – I think we probably had four total vet visits just for, for that throughout. It wasn't even quite a year. It was probably eight months. So um, the interesting that was thing, our first surgery. Go ahead. Yeah, the interesting thing about this, because you mentioned the encapsulated parts, right? There's the little lumps from whatever, that, and and we're not gonna mess with them because you might disrupt something that then, what a spider, spider. Uh, no, that's not what I'm thinking. Whatever, daisy chain effect or or whatever you want to call it, and it go back into having more problems. So, um. The other thing is I read an article of, from a gentleman that had said basically any dog that uh, hunts at all most likely has some form of foreign body infection that has encapsulated somewhere. This is really, really common with cattle specifically as well. And if you cut open a dead cow that's lived a long life on the pasture, it usually has encapsulated pockets inside its chest and, and whatever cavity that are, its body has fought this off and held it there. So eventually the body can break it down, which is why you never find, or not never, but you usually don't find the seeds and all of those things. So um, now you had, you've had a lot of issues with Trig and. And that just keeps coming back and that's on her side, isn't it, Charles? Yep, it's uh, kind of on her, like, Haunch, her flank. hip or her butt, and it's yeah. also uh, under, uh, like, near her, like, not quite her nipples, but, like, in that area of her inner thigh. So it's two different spots there. Interesting, but still in the back, which is makes you think, again, that you probably had that migrator from, like, how else did it get there, right? Yeah, unless, I mean, there there is a chance that it that it um that it migrated in through her skin but it's probably I, we can get into hers too it's probably cheat with her so she probably did inhale it and and it's just made its way and she's through, dealt I'm with guessing. it over and over and over and like things keep coming out and it's still green plant matter at this point it's it's insane that it's still green like there's still yeah, this, a plant this is in there going on three years probably we've done two surgeries um they basically said we can't um go in to her muscle tissue anymore on that in that area so if if something happens where 
we see her get run down, which she's a very easy one to read as far as, um, you know, she's, as I look at her hunting light in the kitchen. Um, so, oh, yeah, they basically, yeah. <laughs> we just, um, they blow out. We get a blowout. We, as soon as we get that thing blown out, we just get the saline and just fill that baby up and flush it out and usually end up with um, some more plant matter. So it's one. Of, this is one that is just kind of uh, we're monitoring it. We don't put her on antibiotics for it unless she gets a temperature or, again, has some kind of change because her body right now is trying to take care of it. Um, get it out of there. The, yeah, and we've noticed after every surgery that the wound track changes. So, and they found plant matter on both surgeries. So, I don't know how much the girl has stuck in there, but it's, we had some come out about two months ago again. So Goodness. Goodness. Now, uh, most recently, and this was something that I thought was very interesting because it's completely different. You had um, lung tissue issues with Mako, right? But instead of, so what Kat and I had dealt with, with uh, all all three of them, well, all three and would have been the fourth, but the three um, was a medial uh, sternotomy. Yeah. Medium, medial, medial sternotomy. So they crack their chest open and then they end up having to wire it back shut, which is the insane amount of recovery time because that has to heal correctly or you have lifelong issues basically um now with mako they did things differently right they were able to do it uh, orthoscopically uh larthoscopically or laparoscopically Lathos? laparoscopically i think okay yeah. i'm not very good with latin me neither and i'm not a doctor <laughs> or a vet so yep she mako happened really 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 fast which is probably good um for her, you know, recovery and everything. So she was, um, I'm pretty sure I know where we picked it up. Um, the field that we'd been running in, they, uh, is an active, very active dog training area. And they actually had sprayed a lot of Canadian wild rye. Um, and we went in and knocked it all down. We yeah, killed it, dried down. Yeah. But she ended up in an area where there was some dead stuff standing. It was hot. Um, and when they're not for sure, that's where it happened, but when they get hot, that's one thing that I want to mention when dogs get hot, their airways really open up. You can almost see right down their throat. And that's a time where those dogs are really inhaling a lot and they can inhale those seeds specifically in those times, um, when they get excessively hot. Yep. So she, so we noticed no change. Um, uh, I got home, Annie had fed the dogs, I went down to let them out, and Mako came bouncing out of her kennel waiting for Tipsy, because uh, those two play outside, and no problem, she just was out there running around. The dogs came in the house, we were in the house for about an hour and a half or two hours, um, had dinner, let everybody outside, and then uh, I came in, Annie went out, and when she went outside, she texted me and said, something's wrong with Mako. And... I, you know, you don't think this. So I went outside and she's just standing there, hunched up, shaking. And I assumed that she got T-boned um, by another dog. So we brought her in, she came in the house and just like laid there, like just collapsed. I didn't collapse, but like just lay down. Like, I don't feel good. So just quivering, shaking in pain. Um, we checked her gums. Her gums looked good. I checked her pupils. They were reacting. We tried to, like, just feel anywhere if we could feel her tense up, you know, by um, just rubbing her down. Is there anywhere that specifically? And um, and then we, I said, well, let's check her temp. And it was uh, 104. And I said, well, I don't know what's wrong, oh but we're going to find out at the emergency vet. So yep. we immediately called the emergency vet and said, we're on our way. Because, and I probably, yeah, I, I was really worried about the fever. So I wanted to get her somewhere fast. And when we got her there, when she checked in, she was 106. Holy cow. Oh. That spiked fast. Yeah. So, I mean, this happened in, we were, at, we went from completely normal Mako to in the ER vet in like 45 minutes. Goodness. Um, we, they asked us a bunch of stuff and uh, we immediately said, you know, we're, we're worried about foreign bodies and 
Um, they were more worried about it being a stick, and I was kind of like, I don't really care what you think it is. As long as you're on board with me, then we're good. Um, and, I mean, and so, you would have probably noticed a puncture wound from a stick, but okay, we'll go with it, right? <laughs> yeah, and they thought maybe if she was chewing on one and okay, swallowed it, I don't I'll know, allow it. it or, <laughs> right. I, basically, it was, okay, we're, we're on the same page at least. So they did um, blood work. Her, her white cell wasn't even elevated yet. Um, and they did an x-ray and sa- said there is 100% fluid in her lung. So you need to go to Iowa State. Okay. So uh, two hours later, I think we're about 11.30 midnight at this point, we drove to Iowa State. Um, they had given her um, fluids. Uh, and done some derb, uh, got her cooled down. I think she was 102 when we checked into Iowa State. Um, and she was kind of back to normal ish for Mako. It wasn't, you could still tell something was wrong, but she wasn't in as much pain. Um, and, and that's yeah, the, the next day. thing that, you know, sometimes they'll bounce back and then the seriousness of the situation is overlooked. So mm-hmm. having a, veterinarian that knows what they're looking for is on board with believing you that you know your dog um, is really important. Absolutely. That's, and yeah, our, our vet trusts us hundred percent. If we say it, he just goes, here's your referral. <laughs> he doesn't, um, he doesn't that question helps. us at all. So, yeah. um, but we get our checked in there and I think, so they did, um, they also were kind of going to maybe try to do one anesthesia event, but they ended up really wanting to pull fluid and get culture started because, um, and again, I'm not great with the words, but a lot of times this bacteria grows in a non-oxygen rich environment. And so it takes a longer time An- to culture. Anaerobic so, then? Yep. So they wanted to pull fluid and do the CT on our anesthesia um, at the same time so that they could get culture started. Um, so we did that and they came back and said, yep, she's got something in her lung. Um, and then they had her scheduled the next day for the second surgery. So we're, this happened Tuesday night, I think. And then her surgery ended up being Wednesday, no, no Thursday morning. So they, the surgeon called and kind of gave us the best case, worst case. And um, that's when he started talking about the option of the um, laparoscopically. Uh, he did say, if I can't see enough with the cameras, if, I, if, there's, if the infection's too bad, then we're going to have to do the whole the, the chest Open crack. Up. Um, but he said that he, judging from the CT, we caught it really, really early. Right. Um, so, and judging by how we got air, or, uh, Mako back, they definitely prepped her for surgery because she is missing a lot of hair. I know. I saw that picture, and I'm like, dang, they shaved everything. But Yeah, I think we, the joke was is it was a first-year medical student they, or a vet, veterinary tech or whatever. They said, here, shave this dog, and they just shaved her. Shaved everything. But, yeah. So they oh, were wow. Able to go in. <laughs> you got really out of uh, control with those clippers there, buddy. Yeah. So she um, – they were able to do it that way. She had a like an eight centimeter incision and then two five centimeters incisions, and they went between her ribs. Um, and the larger incision also has was also the drain uh, to get all the yep. fluid and air out of her cavity. Um, and uh, it's it's pretty crazy, but it was about twelve days. I think she was completely off restrictions fourteen days after. Oh surgery. my gosh! And with all three of our dogs, it was eight weeks. After they'd been released. Yeah, yeah crate time, leash time only. No up and down that. stairs even because that puts too much pressure on that chest for, for them to heal properly. So mm-hmm. um, now dollar amounts, I mean, we've been talking and throwing those numbers out there a little bit. Um, was this more yeah. reasonable then or? No. No? <laughs> okay. It was um, 60, so we spent 1000 at the emergency vet um, and $6,800 at Iowa State. So, so not really. Cheese and rice. But at least she recovered faster. Right. And and the thing is, is I know I saw in the chat, and a lot of people asked us, like, I can't believe you don't have pet insurance. But we have six short hairs. Yeah. Three of which are breeding females. And basically, 
if you do the math, and and I mean, you can come down to it. We can do the math. Uh, we had a thirty-six hundred dollar emergency C-section this year, and we had this surgery, and we haven't had anything since Breezy's surgery really three years ago. So, it for us, it doesn't make it makes more sense for us to just make sure we we know what the surgery costs. It costs seven to nine thousand dollars if this happens, and you need to be able to be prepared for that. And that's the method that we do. So we basically self-insure. We kind of know. You, know, the, you put the, money away, you save ahead of time. But the other side of things, Charles, and I don't know if a lot of people know this, but a lot of these pet insurance policies have caps for each event. Do. So they're not going to cover a $6,000 surgery. They're going to cover a 500 or a 1000 or $1,500 of that. So you're still going to be paying your premiums, and then you're also going to still be paying for a majority of these major situations and surgeries like we're dealing with so and this is the hard thing is this is the this is the thing that is insurance all the way around right i mean if you look at uh how much i've paid in health insurance and how much i've used of that it's like i utilize my health insurance almost non-existently yet pay for it constantly right i mean it's good to have there in case something happens but um with the dogs specifically, when you have multiples, it is almost more cost effective to self insure exactly what you're talking about, which is the way we are. Because you look at six, eight, 10, 12 dogs, whatever, and, and paying those premiums. And we're talking about in 13, 14 years, four times that we have dealt with this. You know, so if you back pay and all we're of in the that, field a lot. Yeah, we're constantly doing this like you. You've had a, a handful of problems too, but it's um, you learn from those and you learn how to avoid all of that as well. So As much as possible, but it's also, you know, the more you're out there, the increased risk. I mean, basically, you're just more exposed. So When seeds yep. start sticking to everything, folks, this is when it's dangerous for your dogs too. Right now. Yeah, yes. right yep. now is exactly why we wanted to do this. Yep. Yeah, we, and we've had some other smaller ones. Um, Breezy had one on her neck. Um, Mako had one um, on the side of her face. It's interesting is that um, th- even if the on itself doesn't have bacteria on it, it can pull bacteria that your dog is comfortable having in its mouth but not comfortable having in its neck. Um, yeah. Or so its lungs even or if the on, Yeah, even if the on itself is – clear of bacteria um it can pull bacteria in. and also like I, I believe that's how mako and breezy both got theirs in the side of, uh, breezy was more on the side of her face but um they can also have bacteria that your dog is okay with having in its mouth so that initial you know where that seed starts to ratchet in which is it's fascinating you learn way more about grasslands than you ever thought you needed to know mm-hmm. um but Part of why they are this way is because it's how they, they self-plant in the ground. So humidity levels, moisture levels make the on the barbs on the on move. And so as they ratchet in, the initial puncture in the dog's mouth or somewhere um, may not – I mean, it probably isn't comfortable, but it may be more like a splinter. Oh, we, been, we lost you for a second, Charles. What's that? Oh, you said it might be more like a splinter, and then oh. you kind of cut out for a second. Oh, sorry. No, nope, you're fine. And then it just as it as the seed moves through, it um it, it can get, then bring that bacteria where it's not you know the dog it was comfortable it was not comfortable but it just the dog's body knew how to handle the bacteria on the on in the mouth because it's a common bacteria. But as it moves in, then that bacteria on the on causes the problem. Um, gotcha. You know, as that as that on ratchets through um, and into and their migrates. into their muscle. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. It. Um, we've known way too many people and way too many dogs that have experienced this, um, and I feel that there is probably that many more out there that don't even get diagnosed diagnosed properly, um, and and dogs get sick or die without truly even knowing what actually happened. 
Um, yeah, what's the what's the what's it called when they have fluid around their heart again? Pericardial infusion. Yeah, I have heard many a dog that that's what they were diagnosed as passing away from, and you can almost I mean don't know for sure, but but if they were a hunting like, dog and in the field yep. training, more than likely they actually had a foreign body infection that that caused that pericardial infusion that then was too restrictive on their heart and as you know strong of athletes as they are they they still can't fight through that so yeah absolutely but thank you very much for sharing your experiences um i (laughs) we've talked long and hard about these (laughs) these foreign bodies and what a pain in the ass they are um so we definitely appreciate you sharing your experiences on here as well yep and number one thing is advocate 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 your dog can't stress that enough yeah. Uh, we will we will push for CTs. We will push for everything. I, yeah. I would rather prove I'll me pay, wrong. Yeah, prove yeah, me wrong. I'll pay you six hundred dollars for a CT to prove that my dog is healthy. Thank you very much. Yep. Exactly. 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 Small price to pay. So, well, we appreciate your time, buddy. And as always, we will uh, chat with you later. All right. We'll talk to you later. Thanks. Night. All right, folks. So. Um, lots of differences, lots of situations, and we hope that, um, that we could help educate you guys a little bit about what grassons are, what foreign body infections are, things to be looking for, how to advocate for your dog, what you even need to know to advocate for your dog. Um, and if you, if you go to an emergency vet and they won't listen to you, Find another one. Push for a minimum of blood work. I mean, that's going to tell you if we're fighting an infection. Um, I know Charles said with Mako, her blood white blood cell count hadn't even elevated yet. Um, but those those X-rays, those CT scans are going to show you if there's fluid. Um, MRIs are going to show you if there's fluid in places it shouldn't be, which is typically a sign that there's an infection brewing. Absolutely. Well, that was a fun talk. I hope you all enjoyed it. Um, let's I don't get know about fun, but definitely educational. Yeah. It brings back a lot of memories for sure. So, it does uh, let's get to a couple questions. We've I got that was his our, our first yeah, this one. This is the okay. first one. Perfect. Spurs and fur outdoors. Six month old can't get him to stop chasing birds when launched. Will chase until he can't see them anymore. How do you stop this? Also, collar condition. So I'm guessing, inferring here, you're working on essentially steady to wing shot and vault training. He's a six month old GSP though, so I I okay headed that direction. But I, it, it's an inference, right? That we're working on steady wing shot and vault training. Can't get him to stop chasing. Now, our well, okay, maybe not working on steady wing shot and vault training. Just maybe, maybe just launching the bird and dog, or the homing pigeon. Yeah, is he pointing it and behaving, and then you can't call him off? Is that the the question? Give us a little extra info here. Uh, Conditions recalled, but ignores it when chasing the bird. Also done positive pigeon multiple times. Okay, so if you're saying he's collar conditioned and you can't pull him off of the bird with collar, then he's not collar conditioned. It's not proofed enough. Um, You need to be able to utilize the collar to redirect their focus in even those high distraction, exciting environments of chasing birds, chasing deer, chasing anything. Mm-hmm. to pull their focus back. We just need to put some more emphasis on the on the collar condition aspect of things. And then uh, next question here is Chris Polchny. Polchny. It says, is Shooter 1 that has frozen semen straws that are available? No. Shooter 2. Yep. Shooter 1 was never collected or bred or anything else. And we learned, we learned a lot from him. Um, not only about advocating for your dog, signs and symptoms and things to look for, but also that the good die young, and sometimes it's a good idea to do collections early. Yep, we so typically we do. do. That now. Yep, and it's a, it's a pretty inexpensive insurance policy-esque from a genetic standpoint anyhow. So if something horrible were to happen. All right. Ryan Witt, mm-hmm. sending my 13-month-old GSP to training in about three weeks. She's still on puppy kibble, high metabolism. Is it okay to switch her now before training? Yes, I would recommend that. If she's got a high metabolism and is still on puppy food at over a year, um, 
moving her on to an adult high protein fat content food. Um, we feed Eukanuba um, 30 20 to most of our dogs um, in the hunting training season. And um, that would be something that you could look at switching now, getting her a good transition, and then she'd be um, rocking and rolling. Because typically going to training is a little more intensive than what they've been doing. So she's going to be burning more anyway. Yeah, I, and I would I would recommend, I mean, we feed you canoe, but it's fantastic food, but making lots of switches is not going to be super easy on their digestive tract. So if you can switch to what the she'll be eating, gonna be using. Yep, or she, if she's going to stay on your food, then um, that would be the other thing during training, too. So let's see here. Are there any other ones? I think there was one more. Yeah. Yep, yep, yep. And thank you for the correction. Laparoscopically. <laughs> Sorry, not ortho. We're not doctors. Come on. Um, scoped it. There we go. Blanket statement. I appreciate it, though. Uh, Caitlin Dixon. Five-month-old puppy working on collar conditioning to retrieve. He drops the bumper when the collar comes on and bringing it back to me. Advice. That's actually pretty common. Um, we would recommend working on collar conditioning to recall without utilizing any retrieving and bumpers to get them more comfortable um, re recalling. Um, what happens is most people say, oh, well, my dog comes back to me really well, so I don't actually have to push the button or use the collar all that often. Then the puppy gets a bumper in their mouth or a bird in their mouth, and they're parading around a little bit, not doing a really nice direct retrieve recall. And then you push the button, and then they're like, whoa, drop the thing because I haven't felt that in a while and that's just really weird and uncomfortable and I wasn't expecting it and it startled me. So if you get more into the habit of building momentum, utilizing the collar every time you're doing that recall, every time you're calling your dog back so that it's not a surprise and startling when you do need to use it for a retrieve. 100%. Couldn't have said it better myself, even if I tried really, really hard. <laughs> okay. I love Th it. Thanks, honey. Yep. Um, it says, how do you pace a bird dog for a three to four day hunt? Oh, I thought you were asking me about hunting in South Dakota. Come on <laughs> now. Run for an hour, rest an hour or two, trying to keep the dog fresh on a little longer hunt. Um, Conditioning. So what you really need, Luke, is like three or four more dogs. Two. Two. Hey, we know where you can get them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, two, at least two. So proof recall longer. We have just started a week ago. Yes, definitely the more conditioning that you can do, as well as just utilize the collar every time you're doing a recall, even if your puppy is complying, that is part of the conditioning process. Yeah, so anything they're doing, they're conditioning themselves to. So if you see a, you know, you turn that collar on and they drop, that's creating a problem. So the fact that you're recognizing it, just split them up for a little bit as far as, the retrieving versus the collar conditioning aspect of things. So I think that we got all of the super chats. Yes, we did. And we are 97 minutes into this, folks. Yeah, I mean, it was a long one. There was a lot of really good information. And we only do these once a month anymore. So it's it's fun to share information, to chat with you guys, answer questions. Oh, it's great. I just want to give stuff away. Okay. So, give stuff away. So, if you last minute here, folks, we've got 186 entries, which is fantastic. Dang. Put um, it in the number generator. I'm gonna give you just a, a couple more seconds here, just as a reminder. In order to be entered to win, you need to send an email to Yawa Giveaway. It's the it's right at the top there, pinned comment. Send an email just with your name as the subject line. Um, we're going to do a random number generator in, I'll set a timer for you, Aiden. Oh, 60 Aiden seconds. loves timers right loves now. Timers. That's yeah. so hey, cute. Hey, buddy. Okay. 60 seconds. Yep. Do, 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 do. Is and there, here, we'll answer a question. That'll give every, how do I do that? How do I get to the question we'll thing? We'll stop clicking on stuff, okay? Sorry. Just there it is. Just kidding. Yeah, there's one right there. Have you guys had? Wrong button. Stop just clicking everything. Um, from, where did it go? Oh, there. Lucas Beard. Have you guys had problems with allergies or thinning? How did that happen? Go back. 
I'll answer yours in a second, Adal. How do I enter? The information's at the very top. It's a pinned comment clear at the top. It says tonight's giveaway. Tonight's medkit giveaway, yawa giveaway at gmail.com. Subject line, name. Okay. Okay, back to the question, Lucas Beard. Have you guys had problems with allergies or thinning hair with your dogs? I have taken my dogs to the vet three times and nothing has seemed to help. We have not um, had issues with allergies with our dogs or thinning coats. Um, some dogs, though, have thinner coats. Um, it's part of the, the lines that are being bred, and they do sometimes have thinner coats or have issues with different food allergies or allergies to like grass and things like that. There's like canine alopecia. Is that how you say that, alopecia? Mm -hmm. Basically just unexplained hair loss. That is a thing. Um, I know uh, Gatsby has al had some allergy issues. Yep. Not but our not dogs. Our but not um, personal. We don't own the dog. But he gets an allergy shot to help with that. Apoquil. Is that right? Apoquil? I think so. I think so. So allergy shots, changing food. Um, but sometimes the allergen is just being in the tall hunting grass. And um, that's something that your dog's going to have to be okay with um, when they're a hunting dog. Um, and some dogs just have thinner coats, and that's something that we as trainers are aware of when we get dogs in for training that have thinner coats. Sometimes we have to be careful about even just them wearing their flat collars. Um, they can get some thin spots um, because their coats just don't hold up to um, the toughness of collars or thick cover, things like that. So, so Great question. A at all for a super chat. I'm researching local trainers and found one that focuses on off leash training and e collar training, and another that does play and train sessions. Would working with two trainers be confusing for a puppy? Yes. Pick which one you feel the most comfortable with that um, will work towards the goals that you have and stick with that. Um, also, I'm just going to throw my two cents in here. I don't even know the trainers that you're looking at, but a play and train session sounds more like a doggy daycare or something like that, um, where they're not maybe necessarily going to be learning structure, proper play, things like that that are really important, obedience. Um, so definitely make sure that, and he grew out of his allergies. That's awesome, Tyler. Now he's just got a bum knee. I don't know. <laughs> um Sorry, man. <laughs> but um, just make sure whichever trainer you pick that they are going to be focusing on the goals that you actually have. And remember, anything that your dog's doing consistently, they're conditioning themselves to. So if your dog's going to a doggy day play area and just getting to mess around, screw around with other dogs, play inappropriately three, four, five days a week, that's going to become a habit. Um, not that that's what that situation is, I'm just making assumptions here. Um, whereas an actual structured training facility or a place where you can go for structured training consults where you're working on obedience um, would maybe be a better option. Yeah, and the, the biggest ticket there, pick one thing that feels right and is right for you and your dog and stick with it. Um, the, the number one thing that we see that can be aggravating from this end of it, not the what looking for trainer, but the trainer aspect of it is we get a call from somebody. It's like, hey, I, I uh, have some questions about this. And I walk through exactly how we would do it. And they say, OK, well, that's not what so and so said. So My it's other like, trainer said yeah, right, I should like, do it this way, bro. There's more than one way to skin a cat. Right. But if you want to learn how to skin your cat. Um, take it to the cat skinner and, and then do it the way and that they did it. And commit to one training methodology so that um, there's no confusion, not no. only on your part, if but also If it's not the working, it's okay to part. go someplace else. But stick with one. It's easier all the way around. So. Agreed. Okay. I think that we have t that given everybody time enough to 60 type seconds in an email. is up. Yeah. Five mm. minutes. Push you away. Push All the right. right button. All right. So uh, 212 entries gave people plenty of time there. We appreciate that. Nice. There we go. Rock and One roll, One to 212. Folks. Let's go. Hell Good. yeah. One, oh, 213. Okay. Okay. That's the last one. That's it. 213. And going once, twice, 
Refresh, 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 refresh. 213. Okay. That's what you get. One, two, two, one, three. Generate. Bum, bum, bum. And the lucky winner is 189. 189. Let's see here. Email number 189. So this is 1 to 50. So you need to go to the... That's Boom. Next. Boom. One more. Now, count down 39. One, two, three, four, six, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. This is 162 right here. How do you know that? Because oh, that's 12. 151. Yes. God dang it, cat. Yes, so 189 is where we're going to. Yep. <laughs> 20. Stop doing that. <laughs> There. Right here. Yes. Right? That's the one you got? That's what I counted. And the here. winner is Dylan Kelly. We need confirmation. You have 60 seconds. He's actually setting a timer this time, guys. Hell yeah. 60 seconds or we pick somebody new. Dylan Kelly, we need a response, which I think there's a delay here. I may have to. I don't know what the actual delay is, but Dylan Kelly. Dylan the, sp the suspense is killing me. Sorry, Dylan. we count really slow. Especially when Kat's counting. In your head while you're counting 151, 152, 153. In your own head. All right. Uh, time. Dylan Kelly, we need, a, we need a response. Must be present to win, folks. We're going to do this quick, quick see. The, the quick, like the, the old Dylan Kelly. Folks, we were running Is out of time. Is that the name that they put in the subject line? Uh... Oh, DK, I'm here. I'm whoop, here. Whoop. Whoop. There Kay. it is. Congratulations. I'm going to shoot you a quick reply. Um, oh, and there's your time, man. You made it quick. I Whew. think we'll have to do a two-minute timer next time because I, that looks there like the delay. delay. There is a delay there. All right, so... Info two. That look right? Yep. Perfect. I sent you a quick reply where you need to send your info and... Yeah, don't put it on YouTube publicly sharing your address. Don't do that. <laughs> no, don't put it in here. Just email us, all right? Awesome. Thank you guys for playing. Thank you guys for entering. Thanks for hanging out with us for this long Yawa. Um, everyone's like, he said he's here. <laughs> we got it. We got we it. We got it. We got it. Um, thanks for all of you sticking up for him. That's awesome. Um, if you guys ever have questions um, about what your dog is maybe going through, I mean, we aren't vets. So if it's an emergency type situation. Don't leave it in the comments. Don't send us an email hoping we'll get to it or write, send us a, you know, Facebook or Instagram message. Definitely reach out to your vet. Um, but talk to us if you have other questions. We're, we're happy to answer them. We're happy to share our experiences. Um, you know, we definitely want to help people not go through what we went through um, with Shooter One. We would love good outcomes for everybody. Um, not that it's a you know, walk in the park either way um, and definitely a financial burden, but um, they're worth it, you know, so. 100%. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in with us. We will see you sometime this next month. It'll probably It'll be, be really difficult. Well, uh, it's probably going to be more mid-month, more like the 13th-ish, maybe before I take off to head north. Because Ethan's so. gone for like a whole month. Absolutely. Absolutely, Oprah. Uh, 
And on that note, I'm the guy with the pink gun. I'm Cat the Dog Trainer. And, and we I've been are out, out of my gin and tonic for a gin long and time. Tonics.